happy 262nd birthday, Alexander Hamilton. Yeah. And thank you, Reverend Bennett, uh, for hosting this talk in the historic John Street Methodist Church, the oldest continuing Methodist congregation in the nation since 1766. Welcome to Happy Birthday Hamilton 2019 program. The Alexander Hamilton Society Board is pleased to offer this program in partnership with the Museum of American Finance. We welcome founder John Herzog, Chairman Richard Silla, and President David Cowan. The Alexander Hamilton Awareness Society, or for short, the AHA Society, has reviewed just under 90 books on Alexander Hamilton. One such book arrived in late 2017, and that was Alexander Hamilton and the Development of American Law by Kate Elizabeth Brown. And looking on the back, we knew it was going to be quite promising because Steve Knott, who spoke right here two years ago, reviewed it, and Michael Federici, an incredible book as well. We do not think of Hamilton as the father of his country, like we do Washington. Nor is he considered the father of the Constitution, like Madison. But Alexander Hamilton deserves to be remembered as a father of American law. There's been much progress recently with the nation learning about Alexander Hamilton's key roles in the founding era. Father of the Coast Guard, the Major General of the U.S. Army, the U.S. Navy, and the U.S. Marines. He managed a suffocating debt, architected a financial system that fueled economic growth and that resulted in strong credit. All that Hamilton did, there was some sophistication to all of it. There was much opposition to much of it. And the opposing party took the leadership reins for the next 40 years. So, how did Hamilton's vision and foundations remain in place then and still today? We're about to hear. Dr. Brown has been the recipient of numerous fellowships and research grants including a James C. Reese Fellowship for the Fred W. Smith National Library for the study of George Washington at Mount Vernon, and the, a fellowship at the esteemed Gilder Lehrman Institute for American History right here in New York City. We are truly privileged to hear some highlights from this book by its author, Dr. Kate Elizabeth Brown. Dr. Brown. When I wrote this book, um, the way I approached it was first thinking about Hamilton and realizing that we know Hamilton really well. He's a well-known figure. Uh, and we know him as a statesman and a policymaker. And we know him as a party chief. And we know him as Washington's right-hand man during war and in peacetime. But Hamilton's contemporaries would have thought of him first and foremost as a lawyer and an outstanding one at that. And in the 21st century, I just didn't think that Hamilton's reputation as a lawyer was really well known and I wanted to remedy that. So my book is partly about Hamilton as a lawyer and also partly about how Hamilton helped to develop American law over time. And so, in my talk today, I've selected three different episodes from Hamilton's law practice. Uh, first, when he first uh, starts to practice law in New York in the 1780s, then when he is Secretary of the Treasury under George Washington, and then finally, I'm looking forward in time after his death to ask what's his legal legacy. And so I'd like to begin today with Hamilton as a lawyer in private practice when he's a newly minted lawyer in New York in the 1780s. And his focus is being an advocate for loyalists who are unfortunately a persecuted, hated group of people in the aftermath of the Revolutionary War. And what we're going to see is that Alexander Hamilton becomes an advocate for them, but also an advocate for all sorts of rights and liberties, and most importantly, the due process of law for all New Yorkers. But before I start talking about Hamilton and his particular legal strategy involving the Loyalists, I need to tell you a little bit about New York during the war and after. 
because New York State, just like all of the other colonies turned state states, experienced the Revolutionary War as a sort of civil war where families are torn apart, neighbors start to hate each other depending upon what side you're taking, the British crown versus the patriots. And New York was no different, but it was different in the sense that New York was geographically split as well. Because beginning in 1776, the British army came and occupied New York City and held it for the duration of the war. So that means that part of New York State is under the control of one sovereign, the British Army, and the other part of the state is under the control of a patriot-controlled government. And this had an effect on the people of New York. Because imagine, if you're a patriot and you want to align yourself with uh, the independence cause, you're not going to want to stick around in New York City. You're going to want to get up and go to where you won't be harassed and to where you can help win this revolution. But the flip side is also true, because if you're a loyalist, you are going to want to seek the protection of the British Army. And so you have a movement of people, some moving into New York and some moving out of it. Now in the meantime, the Patriot-controlled New York State government passes a number of statutes intent on harassing and punishing and denying rights and due process of law to those loyalists. And in total, there's something like 30 statutes, a number of statutes, but there are three I want to talk about today because these three statutes are not only extremely effective, but they figure prominently in Hamilton's law practice. The first of these statutes is called the Trespass Act, and it's passed right at the end of the war in 1783 and in order for you to understand why the Trespass Act is just so effective at harassing loyalists, let me take you back again to what it was like in occupied New York during the war. Remember, there are people who are coming into the city who are displaced. They're loyalists, leaving their homes behind to seek protection under the British Army. So they left their property behind them and when they show up in New York, they see all of this vacant property left behind by patriots. Vacant storehouses, vacant warehouses, vacant taverns and tap rooms, all kinds of businesses. And they now need to make a living. So, under the law of nations, which is a general legal set of guidelines that Great Britain adheres to, if those loyalists go to the commanding sovereign, the British Army, and say, during this occupation, can I use an abandoned warehouse or tavern? And if that occupying sovereign gives them that permission, then under the law of nations, those loyalists can use that property even though it's not theirs, and they get some kind of immunity after the war so that they can't be held liable for trespassing on property that wasn't their own. That's how it should have worked. But remember I said the Trespass Act is really effective. What the New York State Legislature does in the Trespass Act is it denies loyalists that defense. And that defense is called, is referred to as the defense of military permission. And the Trespass Act basically says, loyalists, you are now on the hook for all kinds of trespass liability. You can't use the defense that you thought you could. So that's number one. Number two, the second statute that was really effective at harassing, punishing, and denying due process to loyalists is called the Confiscation Act. And this was passed during the war in 1779, and it basically amounts to a bill of attainder, which means that the statute names certain loyalists, just flat out names them, and declares them to be enemies of the state, and therefore the state can confiscate their property. Now this is not a taking with just compensation, this is just stealing. The state gets your property. And the language of the Confiscation Act is broad enough so that even if you weren't named in the statute, but you were still determined to be an enemy of the state, your property could be confiscated as well. And the final act, 
that I'd like to make note of is called the Citation Act. This is passed in 1782, and this is an act that basically makes it such that patriot, patriots who, uh, or I'm sorry, debtors who tended to be patriots can wiggle out of their contractual obligations from merchants and creditors who tended to be loyalists. And it's just another way for sort of uh, contractual property to be taken away from loyalists. Now, Alexander Hamilton passes the appropriate bar exams in New York uh, between 1782 and 1783. And when he bursts onto the scene as a lawyer, with all that fanfare, uh, he, um, decides to take up the cause of the Loyalists and he decides to do so for two main reasons. First, these are the class of men, the class of professionals who are involved in commerce and we all know that Hamilton appreciates a commercial republic, right? Not an agrarian republic, republic, but a commercial republic where bankers and merchants and those involved in the carrying trade are growing our economy. So that's, that's one reason. The second reason is that Hamilton genuinely feels that in a new republic where we've just gotten rid of one tyrant, the British king, we shouldn't replace the British king with another tyrant, the rule of the majority that feels empowered to take away rights from a minority group. But he knows it won't be easy. And in fact, in the 1790s, around 1795, Alexander Hamilton will write a letter to George Washington. And in this letter, he is going to reflect on just what it was like to be an advocate for the Loyalists. And he's honest with Washington. And, and he says, you know, it was tough. Uh, partly it's tough because of the fact that only a handful of New York lawyers, I mean, then as now, New York is crawling with lawyers, but only a handful of them are willing to uh, take on the loyalists as a client. That is how much the loyalists are hated. And so that's tough. But also these acts, the three in particular I mentioned before, they're really effective. So it's tough to find a way to defend your clients. Nevertheless, Hamilton does come up with a multi-pronged legal strategy, and here the goal for him is to try to mitigate or to circumvent the effects of these anti-loyalist statutes. And so I'd like to just take you briefly through the highlights of his legal strategy. First, Hamilton comes up with novel defenses. And this is trying to circumvent the effects of the Trespass Acts. And the two novel defenses he comes up with, one is called the plea of the law of nations, the other is called the plea of the treaty of peace, making reference to the treaty of peace that ended the Revolutionary War. And here's, here's how the logic goes. New York State statute has taken away the defense of military permission from loyalists so they could get out of, so that they were liable for their trespasses during the war. But Hamilton argues that law is part of a hierarchy and there is higher law that trumps New York state statutes. And the treaty of peace is a higher law and the law of nations is a higher law. And since, he argues, both sources of law give his clients, loyalists, access to a military permission defense, they should have access to it. Now, in a really famous case that I'm sure some of you will be familiar with, it's called Rutgers versus Waddington, Hamilton rolls this argument out, and the New York mayor's court buys some of it. The court will agree with Hamilton that the law of nations does supply a defense of military permission. They don't, they don't buy the treaty of peace, though. But you know what? That's fine for Hamilton because it's good enough that the law of nations gives his client this defense and he can tap into it and he is able to get justice for his client. So that's the first part of his strategy. 